The mechanisms of nonspecific disease resistance act very quickly to combat disease. These defenses include barriers, antimicrobial substances, cellular defenses, inflammation, and fever. The first line of defense includes both physical and chemical barriers designed to prevent microbes and toxins from entering the body. Physical barriers include the skin, eye structures, and mucous membranes of the digestive, respiratory, urinary, and reproductive systems. Associated with these structures are chemical barriers, such as perspiration, keratin, tears, lysozyme, and gastric juice. The body's major physical barrier to microbes is the skin, consisting of a superficial, thin epidermis and a deeper, thick dermis. An intact epidermis and keratinocytes, the predominant epidermal cells, make it difficult for microbes to penetrate the skin. Keratinocytes produce keratin, a fibrous protein that helps protect the skin and underlying tissues from heat, microbes, and chemicals. Dead keratinocytes make up the most superficial layer of skin. They are continuously shed, taking along with them foreign substances. The sebaceous glands produce sebum, which inhibits bacterial growth. The sudoriferous glands produce perspiration, which contains certain acids that inhibit bacterial growth. Perspiration also contains lysozyme, which breaks down bacteria. Additional defenses in the skin, macrophages, consume microbes, helping to prevent invasion. The eyes are covered with living tissue that is continually exposed to dust and microbes. The eyebrows, lids, lashes, and conjunctiva serve to trap microbes and prevent their invasion. Tearing, or lacrimation, is the predominant protective mechanism for the eyes. Tears contain salts, mucus, and lysozymes, which dilute, wash away, and neutralize potentially irritating substances and bacteria. Digestive mucosa lines much of the digestive tract and guards against pathogens from food. Lymph nodes in the mucosa contain lymphocytes and macrophages, which help prevent microbe invasion. Saliva contains immunoglobulin A, lysozyme, and salivary amylase, making it a very effective antibacterial agent. Microbes that make it to the stomach encounter hydrochloric acid and activated pepsinogen in gastric juice. Both are very destructive to most microbes. The propulsive movements of peristalsis and defecation may also remove bacterial infections that inhabit the digestive tract. The air we inhale provides another entry vehicle for toxin-carrying dust and microbes. As air passes through the upper respiratory tract, coarse hairs in the nasal passage screen out large dust particles. Lymph nodes in the mucosa, also called mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue, contain lymphocytes and macrophages, which help prevent microbe invasion. Smaller particles and microbes are trapped by mucus produced by goblet cells. These cells 
are interspersed amongst the ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Cilia move the mucus towards the pharynx, where it is either swallowed or coughed out. Fine dust particles and microbes that elude mucus and manage to enter the lungs are removed by wandering alveolar macrophages located within the alveolar spaces. Cleansing of blood in the kidneys results in the formation of urine, the body's way of eliminating nitrogenous waste. If infection occurs in some part of the excretory system, microbes such as E. coli, Candida albicans, or Trichomonas vaginalis may appear in urine. Lymph nodes in the mucosa contain lymphocytes and macrophages which help prevent microbe invasion. In addition, urine flow and the presence of antimicrobial lysozyme in the urine help prevent microbial colonization. In females, the acidity of vaginal secretions helps prevent microbes from entering the body. Antimicrobial substances in blood and interstitial fluids discourage microbial growth. They include interferons and complement proteins. Interferons are produced by lymphocytes infected by a virus. The proteins diffuse into the interstitium and enter non-infected cells. They interfere with viral replication and protect the non-infected cells. Interferons are nonspecific because they act against a large variety of viruses. Complement proteins form a group of inactive plasma proteins called the complement system. When activated, these proteins enhance or complement phagocytosis, inflammation, and cytolysis. Production of the proteins is triggered by the formation of antigen-antibody complexes. During a specific immune response, the protein C1 binds to the antigen-antibody complex. This pathway, known as the classical complement pathway, continues with the cascading formation of proteins C3A, C4A, C5A, C3B, and others. Complement proteins enhance inflammation, which helps tissue resist disease and heal. Proteins also form complexes that work together. For example, the combination of C5B, C6, C7, C8, and C9 forms the membrane attack complex, or MAC. The MAC perforates membranes of microbes promoting cytolysis. During a nonspecific response, Direct contact between a complement protein and the surface receptor of a particular microbe takes place. This is known as the alternative complement pathway. Natural killer cells are lymphocytes that provide a rapid defense against abnormal or virus-infected cells. They are found in the blood, spleen, lymph nodes, and red bone marrow. Natural killer cells do not have receptors for binding with specific antigens. However, they are able to kill tumor or virus-infected cells that display abnormal major histocompatibility antigens. A natural killer cell can destroy a target cell on contact in two ways. First, it produces perforin, a protein that punches holes in the plasma membrane of the target cell. This brings on cytolysis, the bursting of the cell. Second, natural killer cells release chemicals that infiltrate the tumor or virus-infected cell, causing its death.
phagocytes are white blood cells that ingest microbes or other particulate matter. The two major types of phagocytes are neutrophils and macrophages. Neutrophils are granular leukocytes that are the first to respond to invading microbes. Monocytes quickly follow, transforming into scavenger cells known as wandering macrophages. Phagocytosis is common to both nonspecific and specific defense mechanisms. It operates in a sequential pattern. The pattern begins with chemotaxis. Phagocytes are drawn to a site of infection by migrating towards chemotactic substances such as microbial products, white blood cell components, damaged tissue cells, and activated complement proteins. Next is adherence. A phagocyte makes contact with and adheres to the surface of a microbe. Ingestion, which is also known as endocytosis, follows. The phagocyte extends its cytoplasm around and eventually encloses the microbe in a vesicle, known as a phagosome. The fourth step is digestion. The phagosome merges with lysosomes, forming a single, larger phagolysosome. Lysozyme, digestive enzymes, and toxic levels of hydrogen peroxide, hypochlorous acid, and other oxidants break down the microbe's structure. Digestion leads to death of many types of microbes. The process concludes with exocytosis. Material that is left over is eventually eliminated by exocytosis. Not all ingested microbes are destroyed by phagocytosis. Some fight back by producing toxins, or multiplying, or simply remaining dormant for months or years. The inflammatory response, provoked by infection or tissue damage, can occur anywhere in the body. It is most commonly recognized as redness and swelling on the skin. Inflammation provides early protection by confining the pathogens to the site of infection or trauma. Inflammation also promotes repair of damaged tissues. The mechanism of inflammation occurs in three stages. The first stage of the inflammatory response, vasodilation and increased blood capillary permeability, is triggered by histamine, released by mast cells and basophils. An increased amount of blood flowing to the area produces redness, heat, swelling and irritation. In the second stage, neutrophils emigrate to the area, lured by substances released by damaged cells. Monocytes also enter the area and step up the removal of microbes via phagocytosis. Interstitial fluid and debris from the damaged area form pus, which commonly lasts until the damage subsides. The third stage is tissue repair. Fibrinogen, a clotting protein, is transformed into a meshwork of thick, insoluble fibrin threads forming a clot. The clot becomes a scab. New cells come together under the scab, mending the wound and helping the tissue regain its normal structure and function. Fever is an increased body temperature for the purpose of immune defense. Normal body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. When certain bacteria are phagocytized, the release of interleukins triggers the readjustment of the body's thermostat. Excessive fever, above 112 degrees Fahrenheit or 44 degrees Celsius, can be dangerous, even fatal. But temperatures around 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius can be beneficial in fighting viral or bacterial infections. Fevers help fight viral infection by increasing the production of interferon. Fever also inhibits infection by damaging bacterial enzymes.
Increased temperature also speeds up mechanisms that repair tissue, such as phagocytosis. When the damage dissipates, the body's thermostat is reset to normal.